Chapter 15 Salvation as Subjection The Lord is our King. He will save us. Isaiah 33, verse 22 There is no Savior besides me. I will be your King. Where is any other that he may save you? Hosea 13, verse 4 and 9 through 10 Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Zechariah 9, 9 Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne. Revelation 7, verse 10. The gospel of the kingdom is well summarized in the announcement that there is another king, one Jesus. This gospel is also called the gospel of your salvation and the word of this salvation. In ancient times, a king often obtained his status by military conquest, procuring the salvation of his people from their enemies. As seen in the passages cited above, salvation and kingship are joint concepts in Scripture, and have been since the foundation of Israel as a nation. Yahweh initially urged Israel to become his kingdom, based upon the fact that he had mightily delivered them from their oppressors in Egypt. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In the period of the judges prior to the monarchy in Israel, the judge Gideon heroically rescued the nation from Midianite oppressors. The spontaneous response of the people after the battle was won was, Rule over us, both you and your son, and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. Even though Gideon declined on the grounds that Yahweh was Israel's rightful king, their offer reflected the natural order of things. Deliverers often become rulers. When Saul was anointed as Israel's first king, many rejected him, saying, How can this man save us? Lacking the popular support in his role as king, Saul went back to his farm and worked the fields. Only after the people of Jabesh-Gilead were attacked by the Ammonites and Saul raised up an Israelite force to deliver them, did the whole nation eagerly proclaim him their king. If a man wants to be king, he had better be able to save his subjects from their foes. On the flip side, if a people wants someone to save them, they had better be prepared afterward to acknowledge him as their king. The Messiah king was also expected to be a savior to Israel. That is, it was expected that he would rout the occupying heathen forces and deliver Israel from their subjection, rendering them an independent kingdom under God and his anointed one. At the birth of John the Baptist, his father Zacharias gave a prophetic utterance in which he identified John's birth as the harbinger of the fulfillment of Israel's messianic expectations. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, who have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. That the king of David's lineage would save Israel from the bondage and oppression of their enemies did not mean that Israel would forever thereafter be subject to no ruler at all. It was understood that the one who would deliver would also assume the role of king and lord over his people. Neither the Old nor the New Testament envisages the people being saved by the Messiah without being brought into subjection to him as king, and themselves becoming his righteous kingdom. Salvation is for him. The Christian message of salvation has often been represented as salvation from something, generally from hellfire. Salvation is certainly deliverance from something, from the bondage of sin and from Satan's power. It is important, however, that we focus, as does Scripture, not on what we are saved from, but what we are saved for. It is fine to be rescued from an oppressive master's captivity, but we miss the point of the whole transaction unless we also recognize that the one who has purchased us is also a master, a good one, to whom loyal obedience is now due. Having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. We may have been encouraged by modern preachers to look at salvation as something God does strictly for us, rather than something done in his own interest. 
All things exist through him and for his glory. As with all other things, our salvation is primarily intended for his glory. Paul clearly declares that God saved us primarily, that we should be to the praise of his glory, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. Elsewhere, Paul again states God's purpose in Christ's dying for our sins, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So, Jesus died because God was seeking a people for himself. God saves us for the same reason that he originally created us, namely, that he might have a family. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. God made us for himself, but gave us the option of loving him or not. Like the prodigal son in the story, each of us has made the same wrong choice and has become alienated from the Father. This misstep on our part has ruined everything, not least our own lives. Salvation refers to God's reaching out and saving or recovering what was lost. It is the recovery for himself of something he had valued and which had to be returned to its proper owner. When we read that Jesus described his mission as being to seek and to save that which was lost, we might ask, Lost to whom? And for whom is it being recovered? These questions find their answers in Luke 15, where we have three related parables of lost things being recovered. These parables are intended to help us understand what salvation is. In the context, the Pharisees were complaining that people of the wrong type were coming to Jesus to be in his kingdom, and that he was accepting them gladly. It was scandalous for a holy man to associate with notorious sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, etc., who were leaving their old lives to follow him. In response to the Pharisees' objection, Jesus illustrated by these stories that God is celebrating the return to himself of these lost children. 1. There is first the parable of the lost sheep, whom the shepherd seeks until he finds it and returns it to his fold. From childhood, many of us have seen paintings of Jesus with a lamb over his shoulders, or heard this story told so as to evoke sympathy for the lost sheep. What will become of it if it is not found by the shepherd? Maybe it will stumble over a cliff in the dark. Perhaps predators will find it first, the poor thing. This would not have been the first thought of Jesus or his listeners some of whom were probably shepherds themselves. They knew that the sheep, once recovered, might eventually be slaughtered for an evening meal. To a shepherd, a sheep is not a pet, but a commodity. Though he might have been fond of some of his sheep, to the shepherd the sheep is a possession, whose loss was felt in his own pocketbook. The implication may be present that the sheep is far happier and better off under the shepherd's protection than lost in the wilderness. However, the saving of the sheep was a boon to the shepherd, and is the reason he went after it at all. He saved it for himself. 2. The second parable is about a woman who loses a coin and searches for it until it is recovered. Certainly this story does not have any subtext of a benefit to the coin itself upon its being found. The coin is not in any existential danger. In this story again, it is the seeker who has lost something of value and rejoices to recover it. 3. The third story is the famous parable about the prodigal son. The story follows the same basic theme as do the previous two parables. Something is lost, this time a family member. In this case, the personal response of the lost son is emphasized rather than the searching on the part of the father. Upon repentance and returning to the father, the son is celebrated and restored to honor in the family. Unlike the previous parable about the lost coin, a benefit to the one restored is a factor in this story. Nevertheless, in this parable, as in the previous two, the emphasis is on the rejoicing of the one who had originally suffered the loss, who represents God. The prodigal's father is not simply delighted that he has the opportunity to improve the circumstances of some poor wretch who has randomly walked up the path to his estate. If that were the intended point, The bereaved father could have simply been depicted as going out and finding any poor beggar and adopting him in place of the lost son. No, the rejoicing of the father is understood to be in the restoration of one who was precious to him. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Verse 24. 
It is clear enough in Scripture that the sinner is enormously benefited by being restored to a rightful relationship with the Father. But, as in all matters, our understanding will be skewed if we continue to think everything of importance revolves around us rather than around God's interests. God's revealed interests are that we should be restored to Himself. This happens when we submit ourselves to His Son, whom He has exalted to rulership over His kingdom. So great salvation. We Protestants and Evangelicals typically interpret the word salvation in terms of gaining access to heaven in the next life. The theology of the Reformation is often interpreted as having this focus. I doubt that there are many reading this page who have not been conditioned to equate the word salvation with the concept of going to heaven. To Protestants, this is essentially identified with the idea of justification by faith. Justification involves the removal of any barrier that would debar the sinner from eternal life in the presence of God. The Bible does indeed teach that we are justified in the sight of God by what Paul calls pistis, the Greek word usually translated faith. In much popular preaching, this condition has often been reduced to the simple act of believing certain propositions about Jesus, namely that he died for our sins, arose from the dead, and will take us to heaven someday if we can be persuaded to believe these things. This reductionistic message emerged as a result of the controversy between the Roman Catholics and the Reformers in the 16th century. The former taught that salvation is gained through a combination of faith, good works, and sacraments. Luther and his supporters reduced the number of necessary items to one, merely faith, omitting good works and sacraments from the list. Certain Pauline texts, especially in Galatians and Romans, seem to favor Luther's contention. Protestants and evangelicals who are the heirs of the Reformation often consider the affirmation of justification by faith alone, sola fide, as the genuine credential of being orthodox with reference to the true gospel. However, Heated controversies like that between Luther and the Roman Church seldom generate balanced positions. In such controversies, the rival parties naturally gravitate to positions poles apart from each other. Sometimes orthodoxy is considered to be the position the furthest distance from the opposing view. Thus, any mention of good works in connection to Christian salvation is regarded by many evangelicals to position a believer dangerously close to Roman Catholicism. The focus on the means of justification in the 16th century controversy caused the Church to focus on this particular disputed aspect of salvation to the exclusion of many others. Even Paul's position came to be reduced to a brief aphorism, which became the shibboleth of the evangelical movement. Salvation is by faith alone. Footnote. Something like a password, establishing one's authentic identity. Judges 12 verses 5 and 6. End footnote. In the above affirmation, the word salvation seems to be equated with justification, to the exclusion of the full range of the biblical teachings about the salvation purchased and obtained by the Messiah. The word justification is too often truncated to mean little more than being given a pass, allowing unworthy sinners to avoid hell and enter heaven. The concept has been stripped in the popular mind of its full meaning in terms of restoration of sinners to a proper relationship with God. Justification accomplishes reconciliation, resulting in an unobstructed relationship with our Creator here and now, not just access to a better place after death. Even the word faith, pistis, has often been illegitimately reduced to one's simple acquiescence to a certain list of facts about Jesus, which falls very short of the word's actual meaning and of the concept of salvation found in Scripture. The word pistis does indeed speak of faith, but the same word can also be translated faithfulness. The word can speak either of the quality of trusting or of the concept of being trustworthy. It can mean loyalty, or it can mean counting on the loyalty of another. Thus, both faith and faithfulness are legitimate translations in different contexts. Footnote. Pistis. This can mean both faithfulness and trust, though it is seldom used in the former sense. End footnote. In modern English, it is still the case that the expression in good faith speaks of one's honesty, fidelity, or integrity, or faithfulness. The word pistis, therefore, can speak of both sides of a loyal relationship as between a husband and wife. Both make promises of fidelity to one another. Thereafter, both are to be faithful, in the sense of loyal and trustworthy, and both are expected to trust in the loyalty of the other. 
This is the nature of covenants, of which marriage is an entirely biblical example. We are saved, just as couples are married, in the context of a covenant, ours being with God. In a covenant, each party promises fidelity to the other, and each must trust the promises of the other.